we are all grappling with trying to find the right answers and how to promote horse racing to a younger audience. But I think that clearly we've got to have integrity, we've got to be open with our customer, we've got to give our customer as much information as possible. And I think we've got to learn from what they're doing in Japan, we've got to learn from what they're doing in Hong Kong. We can't reinvent that wheel. It's the 1st of September and it's spring day. Well, I'm not so sure about spring day. It could be winter's day here at Summerfelt. Very, very cold, chilly weather. But uh, nevertheless, it's 1 September and it's a happy spring day to you all. Welcome to another edition of the Group 1 winning Equus Award podcast called In the Box Seat. It gives me great pleasure to talk to our guest today, who's none other than Graham Hawkins. And we'll greet him and we'll talk to him and touch base with him in a moment. But before we get to Graham... Goodness gracious me, you are in big trouble. You stuck me under the bus, not once, many times over the past couple of months, and now you need to sharpen up. Well, the driver wasn't driving much because he's still here. (laughs) Now, you said, what are you talking about the driver wasn't driving much? Well, the bus must have been quiet. Oh, okay. Uh, Now, you moaning and groaning about not getting an Equus Award, etc. Now, you should have entered, you were allowed to enter, but never fear because... It was, I know that you slow out the starting stall, so I acted on your behalf, on our behalf, and I entered for us, and we pulled it off. It's a team effort. Hello, T. We didn't get anything, eh? Uh, you're, still, you're still upset about it. Eh? You did get something. If you listen to my post, uh, post-race, not post-race, post-award interview with Brandon Bailey, you yeah, were but you, you said you had an interview with Brandon Bailey, but we don't believe you because we can't find it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> let's, uh, let's not argue with Andrew. He's, he's, he's old and grumpy, but... Graham Hawkins is with us, and uh, he is a gentleman who uh, we're going to learn so much more about over the next 45 minutes. Graham, how are you? It's lovely to have you in in the studio, in the podcast here with us. Warren, Andrew, thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Great to be here. Yeah, it took a long time to lasso him. It did take a long time, but he's a busy man, and your semi-retirement is looming, but we'll talk more about that later, and that's not the only reason that we've got you here. You know, we want to sort of spend some time with you and and hear your story but yes semi-retirement is looming and uh, you must be looking forward to that although you'll still be actively involved in the game Uh, you know you want to be able to do it on a full-time basis but there comes a time to spend time with family and grandchildren there always comes a time when you've got to say um, you know you're in the exit lounge Um, I hope it's a slow transition to full retirement so you mentioned semi-retirement so hopefully yes I will continue to be involved in some level, uh, but moving to Cape Town, and that's where I'll be located with Babette, uh, down on the west coast of uh, Melkbos Strand area, uh, living with Nikki and Glenn and our granddaughter and grandson on Atlantic Beach. There are worse places to go and live, I have to be honest, uh, <laughs> but I'm going to miss Durban, and I'm going to miss the daily involvement in the industry that I love so much. Let's talk, you know, I always ask the question, tell us how it started, etc., etc. But let's go back to, to your first day and your first encounter. And, and when we were having breakfast earlier on in this lovely clubhouse, and as we say to all our viewers, come and enjoy the breakfast, come and enjoy the ambiance, come and enjoy the view here uh, at the Sommerfeld Clubhouse. Selwyn Simpson. You have a story to tell about that, uh, gentlemen, and, and that occasion. That was one of your very first introductions to horse racing. Well, my first introduction, if I may take a step back, was when I was eight years old. Um, long before you were allowed to go onto a racetrack for professional meetings, Andrew might remember this. Down in Cape Town, where I grew up, four times a year, there were Cape Hunt and Polar amateur race meetings. And I want to chat about the relationship between amateurs and professionals a little later on, if we get the opportunity. So it was a family day out. My father took us all to the races, Cape Hunt and Polo Club race meeting. I'm not from a racing family. And I fell in love at eight years old. I just fell in love with the thoroughbred. I fell in love with the the racing aspect of it. I fell in love with the relationship between rider and horse. I fell in love with the colors and the excitement and everything else that went around that. And from that time on, all of my pocket money was spent on Charles Falls Turf Guide. To get to Selwyn Simpson, we've got to fast forward a little bit. I called my first race when I was 22 years old in August of 1977. 
So I've been 45 years in the game. The year before I was born. It was a rainy afternoon at Kenilworth Racecourse, 1,800 metres. A Jackie Bell horse called Talana won the race. Unfortunately, he got it right, but I had to call it an Afrikaans. First two years of my commentating career, all in Afrikaans. The commentator at the time was Sandy Beckett, and only when Sandy retired was I able to call a race in English. Sure. Uh, so I had to learn to call in Afrikaans. But while I was doing all of this, uh, Selwyn Simpson um, was in charge of Computer Form Cape. It was franchised. You'll remember that as well, Andrew. And I started working for him and doing some form for him as well. And uh, he also ran Emeritus Bloodstock. And they used to have the Cape sale at the old Cape showgrounds, now the home of Grand West Casino. That's where the Cape showgrounds used to be. Hot rod racing, uh, stock car racing, racing yeah. and all kinds of things. And we used to hold the Emeritus Bloodstock Cape sale every year there. The auctioneers were Peter Lovemore, Clive Gardner, David Nagel. I had helped to put the catalogue together. I was uh, very young. This was uh, 1979. So it was about two years after I started calling. And Selwyn kind of recognized that I should also take the step up to the podium and become an auctioneer. But nothing was planned. The sale was up and running. And about three hours into the sale, he came sidling over to me and said, get ready, you're going up for the next 10 lots. No preparation. Um, he had obviously warned Clive Garden and Peter Lovemore. I got up on the rostrum. I didn't know what I was doing. I couldn't see. I was so nervous. I'd never sold a horse in my life before. I had Clive to my right, Pat, uh, Peter Lovemore to my left. They su subsequently became great partners and great friends of mine. And they could have dropped me there, Andrew. They could have dropped me right down. Oh, Peter would but never, they carried Peter would me across the line. You. I had no idea what was going on. No idea. They were doing the birds. I was so nervous. I couldn't see. Uh, we were selling horses for a lot less money in those days than we were today. And eventually when I brought the hammer down, I brought it straight down on the water jug in front of me. <laughs> the water jug smashed, the water went everywhere, and Peter Lovemore just turned around in his dry sense of humor. Well, what a smashing debut. <laughs> so that was my, and then I continued to work for Selwyn Simpson for many years. He was a great character. Those who were around in the 70s and the 80s will remember Selwyn Simpson. He put a great number of deals together, Highland Stud Farm, Jungle Cove, Plum Bold, all of these horses he was involved with. But he wasn't the best punter. So all of his earnings uh, eventually found their way to the bookmakers. Okay. And uh, so, but like, Selwyn's still around. He was a great character and he's still a great character yeah. today. You must have been around uh, in the old days with, with Chris Stoko. Absolutely. Yeah, Stokes. And the, and the Hard Bay Hotel. Yeah. I think once he was found in the fountain, in I the think fountain the morning after the underpants. Met, yes. uh, they found Chris Stoko who went by the name The Rover. The Rover. He was right. the Rover. And they found him in the fountain. Fortunately, face out of the water, <laughs> he had fallen into the fountain on his way back uh, from the Met of one year. I can't remember which year it was, but uh, Chris Stoker was a hell of yeah. a character. We yeah. had great characters in the game in those days. Sure. It's Chris Stoker, talk, talk with Norval, uh, Mark Small. I worked for them in the August when I was the three months uh, between varsity days. Yeah. Uh, Stokes used to come in at five o'clock in the morning because August used to do the had a six o'clock deadline and he used to hear singing in the toilets and the, all the girls would say be careful Chris is in the toilet and there he is in his white underpants shaving in front <laughs> <laughs> talking uh, about you'd be proud of the way you've arrived here today yeah, yeah no oh, wow. shoes shorts yeah it's the usual story with Andrew talking about legends of the game and people of the past and I, I, I say people of the past, some that are we're lucky that are still with us and some unfortunately aren't. One who is still with us, and we're so grateful for that, and, and, and a man who's certainly been instrumental with you and me and many others, is Martin Locke. Uh, wonderful that he still is involved and, and, and pays an interest in us and, and, and our productions. Another top quality man who you I'm sure see a lot more of now that you're going down to the Cape, but we, he lives too. Yeah, he lives in Stellenbosch, so I will naturally see a lot more of him now that we're relocating to the Cape. I'm in constant touch with Martin. He's still amazing for his age. He's into his 80s now, and he's as sharp as ever. Our working relationship also goes back to the 80s and the 90s. Did a lot of work on SABC, Top Sport, and the various names that, uh, uh, that build the sports programs for SABC at that time. Um, and uh, he's just... Uh, one of the great broadcasters, one of the great characters of the game, and still very much uh, interested in what's going on around him and uh, writing a book which never seems to come to an end. 
<laughs> well, he's Gra- been around a long time. Yeah, it's, it's a long book. You are a humble man. You don't like it when we say things like I'm about to say, but you, over the years, you, you, you got the name Mr. Racing is your nickname. And when we were having breakfast, you were trying to shun it off or brush it off. But I, I want to touch on that because we can't sit here for six hours because we need more than six hours to hear about the different hats that you've worn in, 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 in the industry and the different jobs that you've done. But very briefly, touch on the reason why you got that name, Mr. Racing, because there's not much in racing that you haven't done. You know, you've had a colourful uh, career and you've done a lot of work in different departments. Racing has been fantastic to me and it started out, as I said, with my first race call in 1977 on a cold, wintry, rainy afternoon at Kenilworth, then stepped up to the rostrum and the podium for auctioneering in 1979, soon after that to the national sales in 1981. I think the big turning point for me came... I uh, was still working for Selwyn Simpson all the way through to 1983. And in 1983, I was approached uh, by the Thoroughbred Breeders Association of South Africa and the Highfelt Racing Association to be based in, in Johannesburg as the sales and marketing manager of the TBA and also to join the race calling team on the Highfelt of Peter Duffield and Francois Wolfart. Now, Francois Wolfart. We could need another six hours yeah, to know. describe what a character he is. He's still going strong. Love to get He's Francie living in Plettenberg there. Bay, and I'm going to be seeing him en route back to Cape Town in a couple of days' time. He doesn't know it yet, uh, but we always get together when I go that side of, uh, of the world at Plettenberg Bay. What a character Francois Wolfart is. And so that was a great turning point for me when I left Cape Town in 1983, left the family behind, and I was in Johannesburg for 25 years, from sure. 1983 to 2008. And in that period... Uh, held a number of different hats. TBA sales and marketing manager, uh, auctioneer, commentator, then uh, general manager of the Racing Association in 2000, racing executive of Pumalela from 2002. In between times, from a journalist point of view, I did a spell at the Citizen with Johnny Johnson. You'll remember yeah, Johnny, Johnny Johnson yeah. now. You want to talk about characters and a, <laughs> yeah. and a, and a slave driver. Yeah. You must have fond memories of Johnny he, Johnson. He didn't take prisoners, boy. No, him and uh, Peter Duffield and uh, Mark Hessner were the, yeah, at the well, time. Mark yeah. Hesner, has, has anyone had any news on Mark Hessner? Because I had the privilege of working with him at Winning Form in Hollywood. And, I, I, you know, he was very, very elderly. And he spoke to me once or twice before COVID. And he was unwell. But I, he had any news To be honest, on Warren, I, I don't, I don't I, know I, the I whereabouts of Mike. Uh, we used yeah. to call him Mike half an hour. Yes. Uh, <laughs> rather than Mike Hess an hour. So to answer your question, come back to your question. Yes. Obviously, we've got to fast track the answer. Um, I've been very fortunate to hold a number of key positions in racing. Um, I've also been fortunate to, to travel a lot. I've called races around the world. I've, I've sold, funnily enough, not outside of Africa as an auctioneer. I've been to Zimbabwe and Kenya. But I've called races in the UK, I've called races in Mauritius, I've called races in, in New Zealand, I've called two grade one races in Ellerslie, I've called races in, in Thailand and Malaysia and Singapore. So I've, I've, I've been very, very fortunate and uh, the racing industry has been good to me and hence it's so difficult to walk away, to walk but, away. Uh, yeah. but I walk away with very fond memories. Why I got the name Mr. Racing, I have no idea. I don't believe I deserve it. No, no, that's, I'm not going to let you accept that. Of course you deserve it. And I'd like to know who gave you that name so we can congratulate them. But let's talk about, you did a lot of writing as well. You were, as you say, a journalist. You were you know, in the papers and in the race cards, etc. But now, more recently, when I say you've done it your whole life, but now you're doing a lot more TV presenting, Gallup TV, GTV, uh, MCing and but let's talk about your presenting because that's that that you, you along with all your other responsibilities you never get tired of it it's just such a wonderful wonderful part of your job part of my job part of all our colleagues and it's it's a special talent being on TV is always a different challenge uh, every race is a different race every race meeting is a different race meeting so it's like being an auctioneer every sale every yearling every horse in training every mare that you're selling is different different yeah so each and every moment presents a different challenge and I'm excited about that I'm excited about what goes on around you and uh, we have James Goodman to thank uh, he was the pioneer of presenting on course way back in the 1980s again There was no such thing as an on-course TV presenter. There were race callers, there were no post-race interviews, there were no previews, there was no presence of any TV characters on a race course other than the commentator. 
and I can't remember exactly what year James Goodman approached to Wally Siegel some great names that I worked for in those days uh, who were heading up the racing operations Wally Siegel uh, Wally was Gosworth Park he yeah. was Gosworth Park yeah. And uh, John Alexander, and who was the guy, Turfantine, uh, who was with Peter Maritzburg before Andy invented the uh, jackpot? Yeah, yeah, uh, Sandy Christie's Sandy Christie. Sandy Christie's cuckoo clock. We yes, used to call yeah, correct. Because the racers used to go faster and faster. So, so. those years, James Goodman approached uh, Wally Siegel and said this would be a good innovation, and he was the pioneer. And of course, now we don't have a race meeting without presenters and on track post-race and pre-race interviews etc so I've enjoyed every minute of that and yes a couple of years ago I handed over my executive duties to Raf Sheikh as the racing executive of Gold Circle and Steve Marshall as the events and marketing executive of Gold Circle very good gentlemen Gold Circle has got a wonderful team of executives to take the industry forward here in KwaZulu-Natal uh, so I was given the opportunity to get back involved with, uh, with the TV sides, the launch of Gallup TV and being involved with GTV in the day-to-day -day television presentation of racing. Graham, sorry, Andrew, carry on. No, with Graham, you, you, you spent a lot of time at, at Pumalela. That must have been a sort of a trying time with uh, Mr. Eustace, uh wheeling the stick there. It was for me personally very trying. I don't want to go into too much detail. I don't think it would be appropriate. There's always two sides to a story and he's not here to give his side of the story. But suffice to say that it was largely because of Marcus Houston what he expected us to do behind the scenes that I actually left Pumalela in 2008 and came to join Gold Circle. But I have to say this. The Pumalela that I worked for with Brian Mel, Derek Weed, Jim Tennant, different Pumalela to the Pumalela that came subsequent to Brian Mel's retirement. These were guys who understood the financial discipline, they understood they were a, a share listed company, a public company, but they also understood they were in the business of racing. Because Brian Mel and Derek Weed and those guys, they were racing people. Even David Attenborough, when he came to Pumalela, he was a great guy who went on, of course, to further his career in Australia, Australia. with Tab Corp, because he and Rian couldn't see eye to eye. Uh, so those early years with Pumalela, I learned so much. It was a different world because obviously, albeit that I'd been in racing for so many years and been involved with racing for so many years, being a public company gave it just a different, different. edge. But by the same token, my role then at Pumalela was to ensure that the focus of the company was on racing as its racing executive. But then gradually things, as, as Marcus Eustace and others started to flex their muscles at Pumalela, it became a lot more uncomfortable. Yeah, it became sort of a corporate, uh, share-driven company rather than a, a racing company. Yes, uh, that's, it, it, it was a slow transition which then gathered pace in, in its later life with Pumalela. But, I you know, there were a lot of great things about Pumalela. The model was fine, uh, provided that the focus was still on the racing public, the, the racing fan and the racing product itself. Graham, Bloodstock is part of your life still and I say auctioning I mean, and I'm talking about you've been a bloodstock agent you've you've purchased horses for yourself and for some clients and you know you still now in your semi-retirement actively involved from a bloodstock agent we could call it or a bloodstock advisor or what do you want to call it I'm not uh, I would certainly not describe myself as a bloodstock agent I help people who who need help or come to me for advice correct uh, I'm principally in the bloodstock world an auctioneer for bloodstock South Africa and I enjoy that role very very much We've just come out of a very successful August two-year-old sale. Amazing how strong the market was. Phenomenal results. And I find that whole interaction with the vendors and the buyers and the trainers and everybody else that make up a sale, it's a bit of theater. You know, a sale is like theater. And uh, it's just a, a thrill to be at a sale. Um, but yes, obviously, if there are folk who come along to me and ask for advice or, or want an opinion on, on, on pedigrees or whatever it might be, I'm always happy to assist. You, 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 just a thought now, it's amazing, and, and, and sorry, because we do jump around, Andrew knows that when we have our various guests, because our train of thoughts, you know, we, so we do jump around a little, but amazing that your whole racing career and your whole racing life started in Cape Town, and you're now returning to the Cape for your semi-retirement, and it's quite a, a, a warm, you know, for me it is anyway, a warm feeling uh, that you started, and now it's going to sort of end down in the Cape. My family's still all in Cape Town. My mother's still going strong at 93. Well, maybe strong is overstating it a little, <laughs> but she's still very bright and very alert at 93. My father passed away 
some 20 odd years ago. My brother, my sister, still in Cape Town. Uh, my son, my daughter in Cape Town. And then, of course, as I've mentioned, uh, Nicolene and Glenn and uh, Riley and Grayson in Cape Town. Obviously, I've got family in Joburg as well. Robin and Gareth in Joburg with Logan and Josh and Ruan and Simone with baby Alexander. I've got five grandkids. Um, and Devon hasn't even got into the act yet. Uh, he's still trapped in China. Well, at least I'm aware of five grandkids. Well, I'm well, not yeah. sure if there are any others it's running around, running around in China, China, Asia maybe. somewhere. <laughs> but certainly as far as uh, we're concerned, no, Devon hasn't shared such information with us. But let's talk about him for a moment because that's also a wonderful story. Uh, you know, he was obviously a, a fully qu- a licensed, qualified jockey here in South Africa. And for whatever reason, whether it be weight or support or whatever it was, he decided to spread his wings and go overseas and, I, he's, and, and having chatted to him on regular occasions not recently because we've all been so busy but he really has, has blossomed and, and, and I think it's been the, a, a fabulous move for him He's been very very lucky to get where he's got to in China uh, he's employed by the Hong Kong Jockey Club obviously based at that ultra modern new training development which was opened in August of 2018 the Kong Fu Training Centre it's state of the art Devon is very happy there. Obviously, it's been a bit frustrating, uh, to say the least, that he hasn't been able to get out because of COVID protocols and regulations for at least a holiday over the long. We haven't seen him for three years. Sure, uh, Hopefully, he'll get out this year sometime or certainly early next year to be able to come and spend a holiday with us. But he's doing exceptionally well. He's grown enormously as a person. The Hong Kong Jockey Club, just fantastic employers. And, uh, yeah, he's working hard, but he's very happy. Uh, clearly, it's just this whole travel restriction situation that's got to be finally resolved. He can come out of China, of course, can't and come and visit us, but he can't get back. And uh, his job is just t- worth too much to him to, to put that at risk. Sure, sure. So how, do, how does, like, Jared Samuel, he was Hong actually Kong a, Hong Kong's know, different protocols. <laughs> Hong Kong and China are supposed to be one country, but no, they sometimes <laughs> they are and sometimes they're not. <laughs> But uh, you remember the days that Devon used to come and ride work, one horse yes, after yeah, the other yeah, at Ashburton, and, and we had good fun, and it's just so great to see him grow. Because what's so important is, is, is he could, you know, he's taken the chance and he's gone with it. And, and some of the jocks who may battle choose not to. They choose to maybe go and do something else or, you know, take, take a back seat. And, and, and it's important that the message gets out there that, if it's not working for you as a jockey, there's so much more that you can do, but you've got to want to do it. Absolutely. He had three months with Mike de Kock in Dubai at the World Cup Festival a number of seasons back and then took the opportunity to go to China. He was first riding work and barrier trials for John Size, who, of course, is a past champion trainer of, uh, of Hong Kong because Kong Fu is very close. It's about two hours away from Hong Kong, so the horses go backwards and forwards. It's a very interesting setup. So you train horses at Kong Fu, they get on a float, they go to Hong Kong in their race. And, and so horses are based in China and, and obviously many horses based in Hong Kong at Sha Tin. Uh, but they go backwards and forwards and the various stables all have operations at the Kong Fu Training Center in China. Uh, latterly, he's been riding work at Barrier Trials with Dougie White um, and he um, is constantly in touch with Lyle Hewitson and Dougie White, so it's quite a tight-knit South African group, and he's very fortunate to be a part of that. So he understands the privilege and the opportunity that he has, and he's not going to throw it away because he, he's a little homesick. Yes, 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 of course, we want him to come home for holidays, and we're, of course, we hope it's sooner rather than later, uh, but there's too much at stake for him to take any chances of trying to get around uh, yes. those regulations uh, uh, by just skipping the country and hoping to get back. Would you say you, 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 Cape Town, you've worked, Joe, all the provinces in South Africa, you, 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 Port Elizabeth, Kimberley, you've all had some, you know, you've, you've, you've raced and worked in most provinces, happy to say that? Or? Well, obviously, when, uh, when I joined Pumalela um, as the racing executive in 2002, uh, the Eastern Cape was very much a part and still is a part of, of that whole Pumalela and subsequently the full racing setup. Uh, when I joined Gold Circle, the Western Cape was part of Gold Circle. Uh, when I was at Pumalela, Bloemfontein was still open. Kimberley was very much a part of the operation. Peter Miller down there, I can tell you stories if we had another five hours. I can tell you stories <laughs> about Peter Miller and the late Peter Miller uh, in Kimberley. What a character. There are so many characters that, uh, that I've come across in my life. is so much richer for it. Guys that you wouldn't even heard of, Arthur Curry, the late Arthur Curry, a legendary punter. 
uh, who was a huge punt in his own mind, but in reality was a very small punter, but he always had a story to tell and never missed three months of the season yet in, in Quasi. Now, I'm the one that's jumping around because as we speak, you think about well, all of these names and all of these people that have been a part of your life and who've enriched your life. Uh, and when you look back now, absolutely no regrets. I mean, racing has given me far more than I could ever give to racing, and for that I'm forever grateful. The racing is like a big family. I mean, it's... it's Okay, we have the differences in train, some trainers and some jockeys don't get on and all that. But it's, I don't know how to explain it. I mean, we all sort of live in a bubble, really. Um, but it's a, like you get all the, the, the dark humor in the mornings and blokes are bloody swearing at each other. And bloody, and, but it, if someone else, an outsider came in and they'd think, jeepers, what a bunch of loonies. Yeah. yeah, I can imagine if somebody was outside looking in, they'd say, wow. Not sure I want to be a part of that well, community, that is, yeah. but those of us who are in, and they do want to be a part of us, because it's it like a big once family. But big families, as family. you know, we yeah. fight. Yes. And you argue, and you laugh, and you cry. You do all of those things as a family. And as Andrew said, racing is one big family. And uh, there's so many humorous situations that uh, we've experienced and sad. I mean, the Henneman air disaster uh, was probably the lowest point of my yeah. life in racing. Uh, I was friends with a lot of those guys. Dougie Roper had ridden a winner in my colours just three days before that plane went down. A horse that we owned in partnership with uh, Peter Lovemore, the late Peter Lovemore, and the late Clive Gardner. We've mentioned them previously. They became partners and great friends of mine. So when the Henneman air disaster went down, um, it was just, it was such a low point for us all because, coming back to your point, we're a family and as much as we might argue with each other, we fight with each other, we laugh with each other, we play with each other. When racing is confronted with a tragedy of, of that scale, we all pull we all together. together yeah. And right. it was the saddest time of my life. Um, and then obviously when my good friend Donnie Berger and trainer at the time died in a motor accident returning from a race meeting at Bloemfontein uh, back to Johannesburg, that was another very low point in my life. Um, he was a great guy, Donnie Berger. He was very young at the time. His father, of course, was also a trainer. And uh, so, yes, as much as we've had the highs, and I'm not talking about the highs and lows on the racetrack with horses you might have owned, and I've owned many of them myself and been fortunate to have good horses like Kalabunga and Cato Court and Wild Deb and others. Um, those kind of highs and lows the, that you experience as a family off the track when tragedy strikes is are very, very difficult to uh, uh, to get through. Yeah, I know. That was a shocking time. One other gentleman I, I'd like to talk about briefly before I ask you a few questions about the GTH race meetings. Brian Makwa Barara. It was so wonderful to see him in the parade ring at Hollywood Bets Gravel the other day. And him and his whole family, I've had the privilege of staying with them in their home in Zimbabwe, as you have too. Just a wonderful racing family and just a wonderful man and a very close friend of yours. Are you okay? Do you, are you, have you got COVID? Uh, have you got bronchitis? What have you got? It was bloody cold on Tuesday. <laughs> Do you need some water? I mean, please. Oh, excuse me, I'm going back to yeah, Thank you. <laughs> if you need some water, there's water and cold drinks, whatever yeah. you want, coffee and tea. I'm sorry. Back to Brian McRibarara. I met Brian when he was 16. Uh, we celebrated his 50th birthday um, not too long ago. So I've known Brian for 34 years. Sure met him he was a, he was a protege of peter lovemore on the tobacco floors in in harare and uh we've been great friends ever since and he came the closest to giving me my first grade one winner we we raced ultra magnus together he came within a short head of winning the golden horse sprint a couple of seasons back because as much as i've had very nice horses and one graded races i've never won a grade one race but Brian is just a great guy, just a great guy. He's passionate about the game. He loves to have a punt. He loves his golf. We play golf together. It's one of our hobbies. Uh, he's a very successful businessman. He's uh, an auctioneer to boot. He was the first black auctioneer to operate on a rostrum in South Africa many years ago. Um, he's, yeah, he's just, everything he's done has been, has turned to gold. He's got the Midas touch, but he's passionate and he's very dedicated. He's very disciplined. And he's a very successful businessman and a great, great friend. Graham, I say time, you know, because, yes, you've got chores to do today and so have we. But I, I, this is your time and I believe there are a few things we have to cover. 
GTH. What is your second name? Thomas. Thomas. Everybody thought it was Graham Thomas Hawkins Racing, GTH Racing. But I know the answers. Andrew knows the answers. But there's some out there that I want you just to briefly cover the GTH race meeting. You've been very actively involved. You've been the, the commentator. Fabulous job. I've heard that you've done. Um, but tell us what it's all about. Why are we doing it? Because there are a lot of people out there that don't know much about it and disagree with it. So let's, let's set that record straight. Well, first of all, the GTH stands for Global Teams Horse Racing. Not and, Graham Thomas uh, Hawkins. Not <laughs> Graham Thomas Hawkins. And in fact, though, when they came up with the name, uh, they did pass it by me because it only was then when they put it together as Global Teams Horse Racing did they, did they realize it's exactly my initials <laughs> and I was involved as an advisor to Angus Campbell and his team. So very quickly, it all started in the UK with Steve Ajax. This whole initiative is funded from overseas. The idea was proof of concept to develop a product which could be sold into China. Because at this stage, China, there's still no betting. We talk about Hong Kong and China as being one country. Yeah. But in Hong Kong, they've got different protocols and regulations for COVID. In Hong Kong, betting is almost compulsory. <laughs> and in China, it's not allowed. Not allowed yeah. um, so <laughs> in many respects, they're not, uh, they're not the same country, as much as they'd like to think they are. Or well, the Chinese would like to believe that they own Hong Kong. So yes, uh, this is a proof of concept. Obviously, there's Racing League in the UK, which is a similar concept. So for th two and a half years, we've been working behind the scenes with the cooperation of many jockeys and many trainers and with the cooperation of Gold Circle to bring this together. What we've seen over the last uh, three Friday nights and again the final on the 2nd of September uh, this has been the culmination of trials over the last two and a half years to, 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 to try and prove that there is a space on any racing calendar uh, for a team's concept. Now, of course, not everybody's going to fall for it. Not everybody's going to be madly in love with it. I love the fact that it's fast and it's furious and it's a lot of action. I love racing every 20 minutes. We've had the 2020 racing before and I think it's something that Gold Circle should consider reintroducing at least once a month. I'd love to see the last Friday night of every month under lights at Hollywood Bets Gravel being a rapid fire yeah. race meeting. Call it whatever you want to call it. We have to be open to innovation. We've got to be open to new things. Um, you know, we have 120 race meetings a year in KwaZulu-Natal. 20 of those are probably feature race meetings, leaving you with 100 meetings. And you've got to be able to do some things differently for some of those meetings. Nobody's suggesting it's a takeover of traditional racing. But I've been helping Angus Campbell, who's been the representative on the ground here, with Trevor Latterman, no relation to the racing family. They, they, they answer to Steve Ajax and his uh, colleagues in the UK. Steve Ajax is in fact coming out to South Africa, will be at Hollywood Bets Gravel on Friday the 2nd, which is tomorrow night. And uh, the whole idea was just to provide racing packaged in such a way that it had the potential to appeal to a new and younger audience, where the focus was on team competition rather than the betting. We all understand betting is, is the vital component of racing. It's what keeps racing alive. But racing is also sport. We've seen now with the live golf revolution that whereas golf was always seen to be an individual sport, other than the exceptions like the Ryder Cup and the President's Cup, now all of a sudden live golf has introduced golf as a team's concept. Um, so you've got to be alive to all of these opportunities. It's not going to appeal to everybody. I've had a tremendous amount of fun being a part of it. I've enjoyed calling not easily with all the colors the same and sitting in the grandstand rather than the commentary box, calling of a little screen uh, with Neil Andrews. But it's been, it's been an absolute jaw, as they say in the classics. It's been an absolute jaw. Okay. Graham, you know, Graham, do you think, uh, going back to Cape uh, Hunt and Polo, do you think that concept would work here? Well, funny, I'm glad you brought that up because I said earlier I wanted to touch on the, the potential relation. You know what? Cape Racing grew and thrived on the fact that there was this close relationship between amateur racing and professional racing in those days. And I firmly believe for racing to grow, and there's, there's no one-size-fits-all answer to the challenges that racing is facing, but we've got to get closer to the amateurs. If you look at the English racing, on many normal race cards, there are races for amateur ladies, there are races for amateur riders, and it's everybody's dream to be able to ride on a racetrack. I did it once, just in a gallop at Durbanville, and it was one of my great memories from when I was in my 20s. 
that's another story. I took a horse around the racetrack. We worked it for a Cape Under Polo Club, a race meeting along with my good friend Paul Golicki. I met him through his father, Andre, and Paul, of course, is Connemara stud with uh, Paul and Lindy Golicki. They now look after Lammas Kral stud for Peter Kraft. And uh, I went around the track. I'll tell you the story very quickly. Everybody was a Lester Pickett in those days. So we pulled up the stirrups. I was fit. I was strong. I weighed 70 kilograms. I was an active sportsman. I was probably 23, 24 years old on the back of a horse called Feature Link from the 1600 in Durbanville around on short stirrups, backside in the air, thinking we're the gra- <laughs> Cut a long story short, I was dead on the back of the horse with, with still another 200 meters to go. And when I jumped <laughs> off the horse, it was like I had no legs. Thanks. I, 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 I just buckled. I just absolutely buckled. I thought I was fit. I thought I was strong. I thought I could do a Leicester Pickett impersonation on the back of this thoroughbred racehorse around 1,600 metres of Durbanville Racecourse. They couldn't get me back up onto my feet for 30 odd minutes before I could stand again. Anyway, I digress. But there's all these memories because we all wanted to be a jockey. But amateur racing could be a way that we need to bring a broader involvement into professional racing. We've got the poly track here in KwaZulu-Natal, which can take any number of racing. And I think we should be starting to look at, at bringing the amateur racing community on board so that there is an interest across the various codes. Now, interestingly, I had a meeting with Craig Udy before COVID broke out and then a meeting with the Shangweni Club to try and achieve such a relationship going forward. But then we blame everything, to be fair, on COVID, and, and that's also not right. Uh, but this is something that I think that uh, we need to look at, that I think Gold Circle needs to look at. Explore the opportunity of bringing the amateurs more involved with our sport. I know there are challenges with horse vaccinations and veterinary issues and all of those sort of things, but there's always a way to find the answer. Yeah, that's a good point, that amateur. Uh, because Cape uh, Hunt Polo Club was amateurs. That's where Chris Nath came through. He rode in hurdle races. Greg Dabbs, Paul Golicki. Uh, the Bottom Boys, uh, if I go back in time. Jeff Woodruff. Uh, Jeff Woodruff. These guys came through those ranks and okay. they blossomed in the amateur side of the sport, which was, which was strong in those days and which was organized. I'm sure it's still as strong. It's perhaps not as well organized. So get the amateur code organized and then close the gap between yes. the amateurs and the professionals and provide the opportunity for amateurs to ride their horses in a race at Hollywood Bets Gravel on a card not for great prize money and perhaps even with no betting, yeah. but just to bring them, allow them to experience what the professionals are experiencing on a racetrack. Yeah. Good point, good point. I'm sure the operators will listen to your, to your uh, suggestion because that is a very good point. You've spoken about your family. Um, of course, you're married to Babette and, and, and she's with you uh, every step of the way. So we've, we've discussed your, your beautiful family. Let's talk about your hobbies quickly. Golf you've touched on. You can read between the lines you like golf. But is there anything else that... Uh... Yeah, I love golf. I love my sport in general. I'm a great fan of soccer. I played soccer. I mentioned a moment ago that I was a, a sportsman in the days that I was riding feature link and couldn't feel my legs afterwards. I thought I was a fit footballer at that time. I was a pretty decent footballer. But I'm now really also very much in love with playing Poker tournaments, hold them. I'm not very good, I have to say. Uh, the poker circuit is very strong, but we all like to believe we can get lucky, have so I enjoy a, playing the odd poker tournaments around the country. Have you got a poker country. face? I'm not sure that I have got a poker <laughs> face. I think I'm far too emotional. I think I give everything away. And, you know, these professional, co- and there's some terrific poker players in South Africa. And by the way, it's a very strong circuit. You know, Texas Hold'em as a, you know, Monster Jam poker tour and other tours in this country provide many opportunities for poker players to do their thing. And a poker tournament, which can go on for two, three days, is a test of your skill. It's a test of your endurance, but it's a great hobby. Graham, the Equus Awards uh, were just the other day up in Gauteng and uh, always a wonderful function and uh, some, some fitting awards. I think, don't think there were too many surprises. No, I don't think there were too many surprises. Um, there was a new concept introduced. I was part of the Equus Committee, Organising Committee. I think it was, uh, it was a very good idea to bring the public vote into play, to bring the points into play. It's something new, it's something different. It kept the Equus Awards on the agenda from the beginning of the season to the end because of the points part of it all. 
Everybody loves to see a league table, and that gave us the opportunity to present a league table throughout the year. Obviously, the public voting came at the end because the nominees were determined by the points. So the points accumulated through the season were very important because they determined the nominees. But the public voting certainly was material. Two categories that I know of were certainly swayed. The outcome was swayed by the public vote, and that was great. And then, of course, on Wednesday night next week, the 7th, we've got the KZN Racing Awards. These will be held at Hollywood Bets Gravel. And, uh, of course, each province, you know, are having their, their own awards, and, 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 and so we look forward to that time of the year. Okay. Auctioneer talents. Uh, new, young, fresh auctioneer talents. Uh, Fiso Hadebe and... Um, gone blank. Angus, Angus Williamson. Williamson. Uh, just one or two names that come to mind, but uh, there's exciting times for the younger generation coming through. Very exciting, and obviously it's incumbent upon the sales companies, both CTS and Bloodstock South Africa, to find new talent. I'm very proud to be helping Fiso Hadebi through, uh, through the, his initial phases of learning the art. He's still got a lear- lot to learn about form and pedigrees but as an auctioneer he's certainly making rapid progress angus williamson has been around for a while obviously servicing the cattle industry he's a very talented auctioneer and at the last august two-year-old sale last week i had the my first opportunity to work with alistair cohen as an auctioneer and i have to say you know alistair's just a natural or whatever he does <laughs> he's very, he, very talented he, he is is incredibly talented uh he's, he's one of the great commentators of the world um, and, and, and what I saw last week on the podium is one of the great auctioneers of the world. And he's just starting out in that uh, code, you know. Yes. So he's done a couple of sales for CTS, I think three or four sales. But he's, he comes across as a seasoned and professional auctioneer. But he's just a great guy, first of all. And what a talent. Yeah, we certainly are blessed to have him. I had the privilege of interviewing his mother and father at the races at Hollywood Beds Gravel yesterday. A wonderful family. A wonderful colleague and a wonderful friend. Talking of commentators, too, there's, you know, you listen and there's new young commentators coming through. Um, uh, Mr. Neil Pretorius, his son Devon down in the Cape. Devon Govinders trying his hand here in KwaZulu Natal. Because, you know, it's not an easy job. There's not, you know, it's not as though you walk into a room and there's 10 doctors and there's 15 nurses. You know, commentators are not a dime a dozen to be found. So, you know, the, the youngsters that are coming through, yes, they've still got a lot to learn, but my, oh, my, we can be excited. You've got to have a good memory. That's why we know so. <laughs> there's, there's, there's nothing wrong with my memory, uh, Jack. Uh, what's your name again? <laughs> yeah, I think... Uh, Commentating is different to auctioneering. I think commentating is a self-taught skill. You've either got it or you haven't got it. You've got to have this retentive memory that Andrew refers to. You've got to be very quick, uh, sort of relationship between your mind and your mouth. Your mouth uh, yeah. you, you've got to make sure your mind works before your mouth. If your mouth works before your mind, you could, you, you, before the brain clicks in, you might obviously end up with a problem. But we've always had a very nice, uh, talented uh, comment, uh, commentators, of course, going all the way back. Uh, to to the Denmans and uh, you know we were speaking about Peter Duffield and and those kind of guys, but today uh, funny enough I had the pleasure of meeting Devon Pretorius. I had a lunch before he even called his first race and he's dead keen. He's he's involved with rugby, and, uh, and obviously Neil is his dad and he's breaking through. And I was delighted to hear how quickly he's getting the hang of things. He's got a lot to learn. Obviously Brandon Bailey. Alistair Cohen, we've chatted about, obviously, the Peters. Craig is, uh, like me, is getting on a bit, but Sheldon still very much in the prime of his life. So we're blessed to have many very good commentators in, in South Africa. Jahan Malherba has been an absolute stalwart. Ravon Smith's probably got one of the best commentating voices I've, I've heard anywhere at any stage. Uh, and if I've missed anybody else, Clyde Basil, he was, uh, you know, he, he worked with me back in, back in the day. Of course, we've got Nico as and well. Nico, and uh, even Neil Andrews at one stage was a racing commentator. So we've never been short on commentators. It is a skill, though, that is not easily taught. You've either got it or you haven't. Francie was the best. Well, he, you know, he was a great he character, was a Francie. Great. He was a well, great he, character. He, 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 I don't he, think he was the best commentator. No, no, no. But and he, nor did he think he was the best commentator, but, I'll be fair to say. Didn't but he, he call always, the Summer Cup and he got the colours wrong, so he kept on commentating. The horses already pulled up until the worked out who had won. <laughs> and of course, one of the great commentaries was the late, you know, we were chatting about Martin Locke, the late Henny Peterson was a great friend. And in fact, I owe Henny Peterson a great debt of gratitude because I only got the job in Cape Town as a commentator because Henny Peterson moved 
from the Cape to join Port Natal Radio in Durban because Henny Peterson was the commentator, the Afrikaans commentator was Sandy Bickett at the time. So they actually only advertised for an Af- Afrikaans commentator and I, I was audacious enough, even though Afrikaans was very much my second language, to apply and get the position. Not immediately, they tried one or two other guys. And then Henny Peterson, of course, came up here and was calling races and he was a great guy. And we'll never forget, of course, his call at Scottsville when he said, Andy Vanner het gewen. He completely uh, forgot who the horse was. And uh, Andy Vanner het gewen. Andy Vanner het gewen. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that one uh, story you were telling us about, uh, uh, commentated past the post. Is yeah, well, it was on, we didn't have TV in those days, it was radio. It was the slowest uh, summer cup in the history of the race. <laughs> it went on for an extra 200 meters. Let's talk about emba- embarrassing moments quickly from, you know, you may have, we've all had, I mean, every one of us have embarrassing moments, but uh, from maybe from a commentating or an auctioning perspective, uh, anything that you can think of, my gosh, I, I wanted to, the earth to open and me to, to, to fall in, you know? Well, I think obviously my most embarrassing moment on the podium I've already described to you came very early in my career and I didn't actually know anything about it when I brought the gavel down on the, on on the, the water jug, jug of water with the very first lot that I ever sold in my life. But yes, there have been, uh, been many embarrassing or nervy moments along the way, whether you're talking on the podium or in the commentary box. None that I can specifically recall, but I rest assured there have been. There have been, there certainly have been. We all have, I think, in, you know, as, as MCs and presenters, unfortunately, we're all, we all human at the end of the day. Graham, the most expensive horse you've ever sold? Nine million. That was what a couple of years ago, and uh, sad to say, I don't think the horse will ever race. In fact, I know a horse will never race. He's a teaser on on the farm at Maritzfontein. So, you know, horses don't know their prices. He was a magnificent yearling. It was a bidding duel between the Sheikh and the Hong Kong Jockey Club. The Sheikh got the horse at nine million. It was a great and exciting moment for me uh, to obviously sell a horse for nine million. Yes. It was kind of surreal. Uh, by South African standards going up in half a million rand bids uh, but unfortunately the horse hasn't turned out as, as they would have liked. But that's Andrew, you know, you chat to people about, uh, you know, people that may not know much about racing. I'm not saying we know it all because you learn every day. I'm just saying that I've bumped into so many people that don't know about racing. They say, well, how does it work about buying a horse? Are they expensive? Are they cheap? And you try and explain the whole situation to them. You know, there's a case, and we're not focusing on the negative, but there's the case, 9 million rand never made a race course. You can buy a horse for 5 grand, like Amina, that horse of Glenn Cotson's, I think was 5 or 15 grand, and has won, you know, already feature races. Oh, it it's just, it, it happens. That's the nature of the game. But you can always see, I mean, the, 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 the two prime cases, the Green Monkey, and, and the, the, uh, they went, went for about $14 million at one maiden somewhere. Yes. And then Snuffy Dancer was probably the ultimate. Twelve million dollars, never raised, was, was useless. And they sent it to stud, and it was infertile. So yeah, yeah, yeah it was a failure all round. Yeah. yeah. So d- d- the point like I'm me, making is slow and infertile. <laughs> <laughs> so it does happen, unfortunately. But uh, yeah, that's just uh, you know that's racing. They don't know their prices. They don't know their prices. Absolutely. And that's and thank goodness for that, um, because that's what that's what keeps the dream alive. Uh, racing is all about difference of opinion. Brian Mel always reminded me of that every aspect of racing is about difference of opinion whether you're a punter looking at yearlings to buy looking at trainers which are the good ones which are the bad ones etc it's all a difference of opinion and if we all had the same opinion there'd be no industry yeah. Yeah, well, they always say buying yearlings is probably the biggest punch you'll ever have yeah? absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely it's the biggest gamble you'll have so this this notion that there are owners who don't gamble they all gamble. Yeah, Their yeah, biggest yeah. gamble, as Andrew said, is when they've actually bought the With horse that, yeah. because they're putting, they're putting a lot on the line. Yeah, Graham, how would you market racing now? I mean, we've, I mean, we've been going down this way for years and years and years. Um, and I was reading a piece in the, in the Racing Post. She said, racing is a, a game of gambling. We must promote it as such. Yeah, I, th- I tend... To, look, we've been trying to unlock the mystery of how to market the game. I mean, racing faces enormous challenges um, from so many different fronts. You know, obviously it's under pressure from a horse welfare perspective, this whole question of the use of crops, the way we package our industry and the way it is percept- uh, it's seen uh, to be controlled. I don't buy into any of those sort of things. But 
obviously the landscape has changed the wagering landscape has changed the gaming landscape has changed it's all about instant gratification so where does where does a sport like horse racing fit in to be honest i think we are all grappling with trying to find the right answers and how to promote horse racing to a younger audience but i think that clearly we've got to have integrity we've got to be open with our customer we've got to give our customers as much information as possible and i think we've got to learn from what they're doing in japan we've got to learn from what they're doing in hong kong we can't reinvent that wheel they're doing something right in hong kong they're doing something right in japan and it's all about how you're treating your customer and i'm afraid to say i don't think we treat our customer very well in this country or in many other racing countries good point Okay, we, we, we've got a few more points. We're in the home straight with about 400 to go, and it's, it's, uh, we could go on for hours and hours, but you've served on a lot of boards through your life. Are you still on any boards at the moment? As we speak right now, I'm still on the academy board, um, and I'm on the board of the Coastal Horse Care Unit, okay. so very much on the periphery, although, of course, I, I, the academy is is a wonderful institution and i'm proud to to be on the board of the academy i think the academy is a symbol of of hope for the future so whatever else happens uh the operators who are the main funders of the academy have got to ensure that the academy remains a going concern that we provide exactly where we're sitting here at Summerfelt, although not at the academy the academy is our greatest transformation opportunity we have produced and continue to produce terrific black talent that we've gone out and sourced in the in the townships and and you know who they are samanga kamala what a joy to see him winning his second uh, july this year the hollywood bets durban july his first of course came a number of years back muzi yeni uh, who's got his eye on winning the title this year and how great that would be of course samanga's already won the championship so the academy is is as as an asset that the operators must look after because this is a an institution that brings everybody together and provides us with a symbol of hope for the future you, you know see, abdullah was at the races with that, that Ashburton, the race. who was abdullah abdullah from qatar <laughs> oh okay they're back in he was at the academy wasn't yeah, he, he was, yes. yeah, yeah. okay now you know you talk about young talent well I, i've we all as you say we have our favorite jockeys it's not by many means a favorite jockey but you always pick up a rider and you think oh he's going to be okay or i'm going to keep an eye out on him or i think he's got a bright future and uh my man at the moment is young cabela mazzagnani you talk about finding talent and growing i think he's got a very he's, he's already a quali- he's already proven that he's a good rider but i think he's going to go to great heights. two of them um and, and clearly cabela is having a wonderful run at the moment yes. uh he's ridden a number of winners for me i had a very small share in that horse irish tractor that Brett Crawford and James trains up on the high felt at Cabello has ridden him to good effect in recent outings and of course Cabello just stepping up and riding winner after winner but don't forget about Louis M. Cotwa absolutely he is also strong rider and a lovely also human a very very talented rider and all of these talents have been uncovered through the efforts of the South African Jockey Academy and we cannot we cannot allow um anything to get in the way of the future of this academy because as andrew has said we are recognized by the asian racing federation as one of the principal academies of the world once again now that covid is behind us we'll be able to bring in more international students uh from various countries turkey is looking to send us apprentices and uh, mauritius obviously have been traditional suppliers of apprentices here and carrots teton is just one example of how a young mauritian apprentice went through and became a worldwide star and Qatar and other uh, Saudi Arabia are possibly looking at sending apprentices here and riders here to to hone their skills and we've still got a huge role to play uh here from the South African Jockey Academy and uh, so we need to look after this institution your horses you touched on Irish Tractor and through the podcast you said you've had some wonderful horses Kato Court and uh, Kawabunga was it uh, as you say it, it's it's you may have still there's plenty of time to have group one winners you may not you never know but what you've had so far you've enjoyed every winner and, and every joy you've had some talented horses and still to this day you had some lovely horses well i think it's the ultimate thrill is to see uh, a horse uh, go past the post post first in your own colors that is the ultimate thrill 
no matter what else you're doing in the industry, whether you're commentating or auctioneering, all of that pales into insignificance when you're cheering home your own horse in your own colours, whether you've got partners with you or not. Uh, in fact, all of our horses raced in partnership. Uh, but that is just the ultimate thrill, and I've been blessed. Cater Court was probably the best. Ran second in the Dingons to London News. Ran second in the Derby uh, to Super Quality, both of which went on to win the Julys of their years. Uh, he unfortunately died as an early four-year-old after his three-year-old campaign. He was our July horse for that following year. But then I've had Wild Deb that won six. Kawabunga won eight or nine. Ultra Magnus did us proud. Many multiple winners, but uh, also many graded stakes winners, but never at the pinnacle, never at grade one level. And I fear that going forward as retirement and semi-retirement bites and, and, and the financial, financial restriction yeah. that goes with that, that uh, I doubt very much whether that's on the horizon. Well, what do they say about racing? The biggest certainty is the uncertainty. You never know. Yeah, what right. was Graham's last winner in his colours? Come on, let me test your memory. Trained at Ashburton. His last winner in his green and white colours. Trained at Ashburton. The thing of Spooks. No, no, no. Not with Spooks. I'll give you another clue. Trained by Gary I'll help you. Duran. <laughs> Duran. Remember good old Duran? Karari. Now, what, you, what a great moment that was. when we And we were open with the public. We did it on our show. And uh, he was 10 to 1 at one stage. And we said he can't lose this race of bottom weight. It was an MR66. <laughs> he shortened into 5 to 2. He was drawn in gate one with Tubbs Gamedi on. No race at all of quality, but chase shouting him home. I mean, that was probably one of the greatest moments of my last five years. Yeah, yeah, Winning an MR66 handicap at Hollywood Bets Gravel yeah. on the poly track. Yeah, I remember that. I mean, it was a wonderful some, day. We've been treated to some thrilling finishes on the poly track and, and, and racing in general. That's why I keep saying on a quiet Monday afternoon, uh, there's no shortage of excitement. Uh, I can see you getting uh, agitated because you're a times man, but we've got three or four things to talk about. We're, we're with our 100 metres to go. We're calling for the stick and we're approaching the finish line. But Hollywood, it would be remiss if we don't talk. News has broken this week. Um, well, before we talk about the news that has broken, Hollywood have really taken KwaZulu Natal Racing under their wing with Gold Circle. And now we've just learned that it's Hollywood Bets Durbanville and Hollywood Bets Kenilworth. And uh, I already have sent messages out to the team to say how excited and how proud we are. Isn't it wonderful? I don't have the vocabulary. I'm not qualified well enough in English to, to do them justice. Uh, Owen, Seren, Devon, the rest of the team, all the fabulous guys and girls that, that operate behind the scenes at Hollywood Bets to, to kind of say how grateful we are and, and how great it has been for racing. And where would we be without them? And how, how lucky we are that Owen, initially, and obviously the rest of his team, it filters all the way down, but it starts at the top, top. is just so madly, passionately in love with horse racing. Not just horse racing, but doing the right thing, helping where he can. His love for sport in general, we've seen it with the cricket stadiums, the rugby stadiums, the Soccer sponsors teams. of Brentford, etc., etc., etc. He is, he is probably, I, I can't speak, I don't know enough about all of the successful businessmen in South Africa, but given where he came from just 24 years ago, as a refugee, if you like, from Zimbabwe, with nothing in his pocket, <coughs> to what is built. Printing winning forms with Matthew Lips out of the garage To what is built. Yes, of course, he'll be the first to tell you that he's got great guys that have helped him along the way at a great team, but you've got to have a visionary and you've got to have a leader and you've got to have a dreamer and you've got to have a person who can turn those dreams into reality. We all dreamers. The reason most of us don't reach our dreams is because we don't know how to turn those dreams into reality. Yeah. He knows. He's got that magic formula, as do many other successful people. But for him, he's gone from a merit rating <laughs> 50 <laughs> to a merit rating 100 and 98. 98 <laughs> in the space of 28 years. And all the way through it, and this is the greatest gift that he has of all, is he's just remained the same nice, humble, pleasant person that he's always been. We were treated to a tour. I mean, many times we've been around the Hollywood. Uh, yeah, I saw you on the Facebook we were uh, some some leading owners were asked to have a tour of Hollywood and I arranged that for them and we went and we went into the uh, office Owen's office and there he was in his in his uh, 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 running shoes his shorts 
but just absolutely down to earth. His whole team, everybody doesn't fall all over you because that's false and they're by no means false, but just the genuineness of getting up and greeting you and talking to you and just the humbleness. That's, that's as the you say, The team spirit that is created phenomenal. there at the hub and all the way through Hollywood country is is just another example of how he values each and every person that operates at whatever level. Yeah. It is an example, I think. I don't know that there's a company in this country that has achieved higher standards. I'm not saying maybe more profits, maybe more turnover, whatever the case may be, but higher standards of, of compassion and humanity and humility and success as Hollywood has done over the last 25, 26 years. Now, semi-retirement, your plans, obviously, I, 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 I'm not sure that you've planned it day by day, but obviously time with the family, time with the grandkids, a bit more golf, uh, holiday maybe, and still work, some work behind the scenes. You're going to come up to KZN and see us and do a few stints with us on the TV, which we so look forward to. But any other plans, really? Uh, just No, I want to keep working. Um, as much as I fully accept and understand I've got to the stage of my life where I've got to take a step back and others have got to carry the baton forward and hopefully more successfully than I was ever able to carry the baton, I still believe I have a lot to offer. And, uh, and from what I'm hearing, I think Gold Circle are happy to provide me with an opportunity to continue to be involved, al although perhaps on a lesser scale. Uh, so I need to keep working. I'm far too young to do nothing. But yes, obviously one... One of, you know, COVID taught us one thing, is uh, one positive thing to come out of COVID was the appreciation of your family, the appreciation of time, the appreciation of the love of simple things in life. And to, to enjoy your family to the max and to make sure that you see, to see them, speak with them, lunch with them, have fun with them, travel a little bit. Overseas travel for me is out of the question. I don't think we'll be able to afford that. But certainly getting to know your own country, getting around to see the flowers in the Macquiland. I live and grew up in Cape Town. I still haven't seen the flowers in the Macquiland, and I'm now 67 years old. So there's a lot of things still to do right here on our doorstep, and make sure that the last thing you're doing is sitting still and wondering what you should be doing. Yeah. <coughs> Retirement is a, it's not easy. No. You uh, also it's, see it's, me retired. It's you. something that frightens you because you, you can fall into the trap of, of walling in your own self-pity. That's... Uh, but you know, yeah, uh, you know I, I read something this morning. Worrying is something is like a rocking chair. It gives you something to do, but get, goes nowhere. It goes nowhere. Yeah, 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 you know. So don't don't sit in a rocking chair. Whatever you're doing, don't sit, sit in a rocking chair. chair. It doesn't go anywhere. Make sure you're active. Make sure your mind is active. And and I'm going to try and achieve that, whatever it takes. Yeah, and sit in front of my laptop. The morning Maybe the write a book. And I think, what am I going to do if, <laughs> if they cut off the, the lifeline? Well, yeah. maybe we should write a book, Andrew. We should write a book, yeah. yeah. A good idea. No, well, I mean, I'm not being, you don't give yourself, nor do you, although you're grumpy and come across as that hard exterior and I'm a big Brieke or whatever you... What's a Brieke? Is that right? Of a Brieke is a... What is a Brieke? A Brieke is a is no, tough I'm a, fighter. I'm Brieke, Brieke is the Afrikaans word for Harrison. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So More you, like you, a skater. You, no, you've, no, got, you've got that gentleness about you, and both of you, you're quite right, because you can't be... Uh, Talent can't be lost to the industry. And, and you're going to say, oh, don't be silly. And you, you need to accept it. You need to both give yourself a bit more credit than you do. Now, news quickly as we wrap up. The sales we've spoken about, phenomenal results. Really great. And it's positive that people are still buying horses and, and the sales were strong. We were there and it was good. Unbelievable. I think pound for pound, it was the strongest sale of the year. Soccer, uh, you like your soccer. There was a shock result or a, or a wide margin result recently. Just touch on that because I, I don't know anything No, it wasn't about a soccer. shock result. I mean, Liverpool beating Middlesbrough 9-0, which led to the uh, Scott Parker losing his job. But I think uh, it's also nice to see Manchester United back on track. Hopefully they beat Leicester tonight. And I think Brendan Rodgers might be the next on the chopping block if Manchester United win tonight. But no, I mean, obviously Manchester United and Liverpool got off to very slow starts. But the shock of the week would be Chelsea losing to Southampton. And Thomas Tuchel is under pressure. So there are lots of people in this world that are under pressure outside of the racing fraternity. <laughs> now, uh, Hollywood, as we've spoken about, Hollywood bets Durbanville, Hollywood bets Cape Town. Because Hollywood obviously involved with KZN now with Cape Town, maybe we'll uh, get a chance to go down and see the purple and the cape. You know, you never know. I'm well, sure Owen's listening. We can go down and see what they're doing down there. We might crack another uh, trip to the Met. Oh. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. I'm sure we will. I'm sure J &B we will. used to give us a bloody right royal time. 
Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. We're we talking are. about the World Sports Betting Met. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the, the Equus Awards uh, we've touched on, also phenomenal results. Uh, there's a soccer bet that we need to touch on. We're speaking about soccer. Um, it's called the soccer, uh, the score 10 and the score 6 bets. Graham, you know a bit more about the score 6 and the score 10 bets. Touch on that. Very bit similar to, if not exactly the same as the uh, soccer 6 and the soccer 10, but these are pools that are exclusively owned by Tab Gold. And okay. obviously we're looking to promote those and to grow those pools. Uh, as part of the Tab Gold bouquet of betting options. Okay, okay, beautifully put. All right. Uh, you were telling me that Shane Humby's relocated back to the Cape. Gone back to Cape Town, yeah. Okay, so... Uh, left on Monday. Left on Monday. Well, uh, he... Going to be private trainer to Graham Hawkins. <laughs> <laughs> now, he is such a quiet man, he doesn't tell anybody. I didn't know that, so he just woofed, he's gone. So we wish Shane a very uh, happy relocation. And yeah, we he hope he that told us go. if we're ever down in Cape Town, not to visit. Okay, well then, that's, that's, that's Shane for you. But we wish him all the very best, and we hope that things go from strength <laughs> to strength with him. Okay, Graham... All that's left for me to do is to, is to thank you for your time. It's been long, but it's been fabulous. And as I said, we could even do a part two and a part three, but we're not going to pull you out of your semi-retirement. From my side and from racing side, thank you. And, and uh, we, I won't say we'll miss you. Of course, we'll miss you seeing you on a day-to-day -day basis. But uh, you're not gone. You're down in the Cape. You're back in KwaZulu Natal. You're back with some forwards. We'll see you at sales. We'll see you on TV. And hopefully, if we get an invite, Andrew and I, to the Cape, we'll see you down in the Cape. And, uh, yeah, we look forward to, to, to being with you. And just thank you from my side because, uh, you know, you were instru we talk about people that were instrumental in one another's career. You were very instrumental in my career. And, and the little that I know, because I say the little because we're learning day to day, you've taught me and, and Martin Locke. So thank you for that. And, and we just wish you and your family all the very, very best. Warren, Andrew, thanks very much. And uh, I'm sure we've outstayed our welcome on this show. And I've outstayed my welcome, <laughs> no, which is something all. that I generally get accused of. <laughs> uh, but thanks very much for the opportunity. No, thank you, Graham. Thanks for being with us. Lovely. Okay, that's a wrap from all of us. Graham Hawkins, Andrew Harrison, Warren Lee Inferna. As you know, by now, this is tongue-in-cheek. We can now call ourselves a Group 1 winning podcast in the box seat. Thank you to Wanda. Thank you to to Wanda and to uh, Minnie. And, of course, to Lucky, who's just joined the team. Thank you to everybody for your kindness. We wish you all the best. Punt well. And we wish Graham Hawkins all the best. And we thank him from the bottom of our hearts for all that he's done for this industry that we love so much. We will see you as always. Where will we see you, Tawanda? In the number one box. That's where we'll see you.